Okay, would you agree? Exceptional people are by definition not normal. Yep. Thank you, Kelly. Yep, there's a quite a strong yep from the back left corner. Thank you, Kelly. Well, Excellent. Exceptional people are not normal. They're exceptional. And Samson is going to be an exceptional kind of man. He's going to be an exceptional guy. A standout hero for God and God's cause amongst the people of his generation. He's going to stand out. He's not going to be normal. In fact, he's going to be a great hero amongst the greatest heroes of Scripture. He's going to be a man and a half. Do you want to be his pastor? <laughs> the guy is completely abnormal. By God's grace. No one who's done great things in this world was ever going to settle for just being normal. Exceptional is what's needed. For leading ordinary people through great challenges. And Samson lived in days of great but invisible challenges. Remember that from last time? I better do it again. No. You've got the tips. Fantastic. Always go on YouTube, always check it out. Um, just to make sure I haven't gone too far. Um, here's a guy who was living in a time when people didn't realise how bad things had become. And Samson was the guy who was going to draw the line in the sand and then defend it. Alone! With no soldiers, no army, alone. One man, job on the bass, well, you know the rest of it. Drawing the line in the sand. Dealing with apparently invisible challenges to everybody else. Living when the prevailing culture was to appease lifestyles and ideologies riddled with sin. Sin that most people were simply oblivious to. And in days of compromise like those, Samson particularly needed distinct features that made him stand out, that set him apart. If your devotion to God makes you seem odd in a compromised society, not your own personal oddity, because you're odd, but because of your devotion to God, then it seems likely you're doing something right, doesn't it? And from the start, God's decision, not Samson's, not his parents, was that Samson should be subject to a Nazarite vow. It wasn't just that he was a hairy hermit. I mean, everybody noticed he had a lot of hair. Just in my own defence, my own barber is shut at the moment for redevelopment. Um, they're redoing the place, but I will get back there. Okay? You could see the guy was different, set out, set apart. Not because he was an oddity, but because of his devotion to God and the pattern that that took. We'll get to that later. What we're looking at overall is Samson, a flawed hero. Right? That's the series. And what we're looking at today is what sort of home raises a hero for God? What sort of home does that? Not a perfect home. So no, nobody's allowed to feel guilty. Okay. No parental guilt is allowed in the room. Huh? There's no, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, called to God for his purpose. You can't go wallowing and all that stuff. It'll make you a worse person and you won't be happy. Neither will I. Because you'll bite me for what I say to you next. But what we are doing is looking at what sort of flawed home is the sort of home that raises heroes for God. Is that relevant? The people who stand out at times of great compromise when a line needs to be drawn and defended so that others can see it and see where their appeasement has gone and come back to God. The first thing we learn then about this home of his that raises a hero for God is that of themselves his parents cannot have children at all. The opportunity to have the sort of home we're desiring comes to Manoah and his wife purely by grace. And it's very clearly pointed out like that. And from that point on, gratitude is what drives all their responses. Because three whole verses at the very outset are dedicated to pointing out the fact that Samson comes from a childless Home. Certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless and able to give birth. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? When God is about to raise up a man who will be world-changing, here is where he chooses to make a start. 
If we're going to start on this, it's going to be all down to God's grace. Incidentally, it's not just Manoah's wife, is it? There's Sarah, there's Hannah, there's Elizabeth. Look what God brings from that. He seems to delight in it. In fact, there seems to be a history of godliness and childlessness in the Bible. So, those of us who perhaps have difficulty getting started, um, you know, there's encouragement there. Uh, that generation and our generation tends to link the idea of childlessness would perhaps you've done something wrong. And God say, no, no. God sees it completely differently. And as with both Sarah and Elizabeth, the birth of this significant baby gets announced by the angel of the Lord. Now that opens a whole lot of questions about who the angel of the Lord is. Now, we haven't got time for two pages of my notes on that. Okay? Seriously. We haven't. So I'm just turning over. But, what it comes down to is this. There's a whole bunch of people, I mean the synopsis, there's a whole bunch of people who reckon that the angel of the Lord is Jesus. There are all sorts of ways of confusing the way Hebrew works to make that happen in the Old Testament. You come through to the New Testament, it never says, it never translates the angel of the Lord as the angel of the Lord in, in, in Greek. It uses the indefinite article, an angel of the Lord. You don't get the angel of the Lord in the New Testament. And actually you've got a verse in Hebrew that says, to which angel did God ever say at any, any time, you are my son, today I have begotten you? So the whole can of worms there exegetically and in terms of our reading of Old Testament theology, okay? I've just pointed to that, it's irrelevant for us now, and I've just skipped two pages. Are you happy? Especially about the two pages. God's messenger of some description or other, and let's not get too tangled up with things that are going to actually subvert our doctrine of the Trinity, comes to them from God. And he's an angel, which means messenger from God. That's the least he is. And he comes in with this promise from the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, end of verse 3, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Ah, oh, great. But this woman has got no idea what she's in for. It must have seemed like every childless woman's dream at that time, a son, that which she longed for, agonized anguish for, she's now being promised by the angel of the Lord. Little did she know of the agony and anguish and longing that this extreme blessing was going to bring to her. That's the way it's going to go. The privilege brought pain and awesome responsibility. You know how often it does? And she is to raise him to be exceptional from the start. This is four to five. Leaders for God, for difficult days, don't just happen. Their character is crafted from birth by the commandment of God. Let me tell you a story because you're looking as if you've had too much already. Uh, a distinguished elderly pigman was uh, with a bunch of other pigmen at a large county show. In fact, I can tell you it's the Bath and West. And uh, they were there standing in the bar as is they want after the judging. After the judging. And uh, of course he'd done really rather well yet again with some of his huge humongously large saddleback sows, you know what I mean. And we were chatting away at the bar and uh, the guy started giving quite a ribbon for the way he feeds his pigs. Because he's not mean with his pigs. And uh, they started teasing him that he, you know, he, he, uh, that he bedded down his sows on pig meal, you know. All the rest of us <laughs> using straw, he's bedded them in pig meal, giving them so much to fill them with a pump, you know. And I thought, this guy, he's been out of any guy, he's, you know, he doesn't need all this rubbish, so I sort of gently tried to come into his defence and, you know, whatever, and I must have made a fist of it. But he quietly turned to me away from his detractors and he, he said in a, in a quiet and conspiratorial tone, as if, as if he was conveying the sacred wisdom of the ancients. He said, uh, it was Northern, lad, the job's only half breeding, the other half's feeding. The job's only half breeding. The other half is feeding. Absolutely right. And it's true when it comes to raising people for God who will be ex you know, exceptional people for Him. You want to raise heroes for God, only half of it is the genetics, isn't it? And the other half is the, the rearing men. How are they fed? How are they formed? They're going to be more than ordinary. We're here to raise people who will stand up and stand out in our generation needed. 
Distinctive, unusual people. A people singularly set apart for God. And from the very start, Samson was to be consciously raised to make him, not just a weirdo, but singular, exceptional, set apart for God. And even his mother, during gestation, is to abstain from alcohol or anything unclean. And when he's born, Samson mustn't get his hair cut. Now, there are lots of different things, different aspects of of the Nazarite's vow, okay, no haircuts, no alcohol, type, nothing dead, it was temporary, it was voluntary, it was for a certain period of time and so on. Where Samson's concerned, well, yeah, no haircuts. But it was his mother who did no alcohol, it was his mother who did nothing unclean. He just had the haircut there. Now, I don't understand this, and I don't know why it's the case, okay, but that's the case. He's there with haircuts, he touches dead things, and so on and so on. He, he's certainly present at some revelries, where a fair bit of juice gets knocked back, and you can't imagine he's not involved in all of that. But there's something special, even standing out from the Nazarite vow, particular about Samson. He wasn't just sucking in Philistinism the way everyone else was. And there was visible evidence that he was different, set apart, exceptional from all of that. God's got a plan for him. He's going to be a hero. He's going to be a hero to rival real life hero to rival anything in the make-believe myths of antiquity. But there are means by which that is going to be achieved. It really isn't going to be all that easy. It'll be a painful, hard process, particularly for his mum and his dad. And when you look at where this whole thing starts, it starts with the grace of God to a childless soul with a certain sort of potential mother and a certain sort of potential father. Verses 2 to 3 of chapter 13. It started in a childless home. It started in a complementarian home. I'm not going to make a big fist of this, but, but verses 6 and 7. The woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. Didn't ask him where he came from. He didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, You'll become pregnant and have a son. Now they drink no wine and so on and so on and so on. She went to her husband and told him, Why? Why didn't you just get on then? Because in our age, in our culture, the woman says, my choice, I'm deciding. It's a woman's choice, I'm deciding on this. And, and actually, interestingly, what happened next was he said to her, hang on a minute, that's a huge responsibility. I need to hear that myself. I want to check that out. He goes back to God and he prays again, and he says, Lord, you know, please, if this is, send the man again, I need to check this out. He's taking the responsibility in his own home for the way it's going to run. It's on his neck. He feels that it's his responsibility. And you know, she never turns around to him and says, Oh, you're treating me like an idiot. <laughs> Do you see the point? He takes it completely seriously, and she doesn't criticise him for taking responsibility in that way. Now, there's going to come a time when he does something stupid, and she corrects him, and he gets put right by her. That's not the issue. It's just she's happy for him to take responsibility for this big responsibility that's fallen on the home. It's a praying home, verses 8 to 10. When I pray to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. And God heard Manoah, and the angel of the Lord came again to the woman while she was out in the field. But her husband Manoah wasn't there, so the woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah takes it completely seriously. He does not for one minute doubt that God is going to give him a son. But it wouldn't have been very surprising if he said, ah, woman, too much cheese for supper. Right? It wouldn't have been surprising at all. No, he's a man of faith. I, I can't believe it doesn't say, but I just can't believe he hasn't been praying for some time. One son. And God comes along with an angel and the wife comes with the story. and That's fine, but he's saying, look, Lord, I need, I need to know this myself. How to do it. Not whether it's going to happen, but how to proceed. Two things on his mind. Firstly, pardon your servant. The man has got a sense of his own sin and dependence on the mercy of God. That's a characteristic of a home that raises spiritual heroes. Secondly, Lord, will you show us how to obey you? We need to get this right. The man's got a sense of what he's for and a desire to walk uprightly with God. Lord, show us how to obey. And God hears and answers the prayers of people like that. Now, if you've been a parent for a while, um, you know you're not adequate to raise a child on your own. 
guys, when we're talking with, you know, men who are parents, what's the biggest topic of conversation that actually means something? When you get through to a meaningful conversation with, with guys of our age, a bit younger, I have to say a bit younger, um, <laughs> here's the big issue, ladies, you wouldn't know this, because we keep it right out of your sight. The whole issue of how we function in our homes, how we raise our kids, the problems we're having with all of those things. When guys get through to a meaning, meaning, more meaningful level of connection and conversation, here are the things that are concerning guys. How do we do this right? We're not up to this job. I've got teenage kids, they say. Oh yeah, oh mate, I know, yeah. But it's just like a women's coffee morning there. <laughs> no, it's not. But, but you get the idea. God hears the prayer of that guy. Time to be a parent pushes you to the edge of your resources and you end up looking over the edge into what looks like a significantly larger bit. And this guy says, Lord, I need to know how to do this. Behind Christian heroes, spiritual heroes, you find either natural or spiritual praying parents. Praying because they want to do it right and they want to obey God. And Manoah asked how to raise Samson, and God was happy to send the angel of the Lord again to make sure. God has, he, we can't make that demand of him. But he's happy by his grace to go over it again. That's how keen God is to hear praying parents' prayers when their heart is in their hand to obey. We have imperfect homes. Our children see us as imperfect people. What we can do is we can pray for them. And that's a significant thing in the forming of spiritual heroes. Fourthly, homes that raise spiritual heroes are definitely God-fearing homes. And that's not to say it's a lost cause if we come from non-Christian homes. I came from a non-Christian home, but there are a couple of few God-fearing fathers in Israel who swept me up under their wing. I had a spiritual home in other places. But in general terms, by some means or other, spiritual heroes are raised in God-fearing homes. There are two F's in Samson's God-fearing homes. Spot them in Manoah's response to the angel on that second angelic visit. Faith. When your words are fulfilled, what have we got to do? When. Not if. When. Faith. When your words are fulfilled. And faithfulness. What is to be the rule? What are we to do? What is to be the rule that governs the boys' life and work? Look at this. There's no opposition of parental aspirations to the will of the Sovereign Lord. Do you see that? I really want a son. And there's no hint of, God has answered our prayers for a son now. We wanted to be a solicitor. <laughs> Don't you see that? Oh, my hopes are piled on this child. God says, yeah, you wait and see what he's going to be like. Because that's my decision, not yours. You know what I'm talking about. Our children are not truly ours. They're his. And the God-fearing parent knows that they are a trustee, not a proprietor. And when Manoah is here to pray, he's here to pray to know how God wants that call to parenthood fulfilled. For this boy. He asks not for his own plans for the boy to be fulfilled, which is the way we normally pray for our kids, but to know how to obey God in raising that child. To please God. There's a lot to be learned from that. Faithful, God-fearing folks looking to be obedient to God. Those are the ones who raise spiritual heroes. But in case you get the idea that this is all a matter of rules and regulations and self-righteousness, it's far from that. That is a disaster for, for, for rearing children. Have you noticed that before? A rules-based economy in the home is a disastrous way to raise kids. They will not become spiritual heroes that way. It's far from that in this home. Samson's home to be is a worship-driven home. It's a worship-driven home. A gratitude-worshipful home. Uh, look at Manoah's desires here. He wants to be sure to, to know how to obey God. He wants the opportunity to be hospitable to God's messenger. He wants to honour God in it all. And that's what's driving me. What am I going to do? I want to honour God in this. Verses 19 to 23, it's a worshipping home. Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what's your name? So we may honour you when your word comes true. And he replied, why do you ask my name? Beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with a grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock to the Lord. 
What's his response to this? Worship. Notice that, see, <laughs> oh, this is a bit of a hobby horse. You ready? Can you spend this two minutes? Right? You're going to stop in a minute. He doesn't sing the Lord a nice song, but makes him feel good. He makes a sacrifice. Make a sacrifice. Spontaneously rejoicing that God is at work and that he is going to be part of something that makes a difference. When Noah makes a sacrifice in worship. But then he gets the collie wobbles. Does that ring any bells of anybody? Rings bells for me. We're doomed! <laughs> you read that last week, just like Fraser from Dad's Army, and it was just amazingly funny. And it was great. You know, we're doomed! <laughs> we're doomed, says Manoah. We're doomed to die, he says to his wife. He's got everything, he's doing so well, and he love him. And then he just sort of trips, you know? We're doomed to die, we've seen God. But his wife answered, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things, or now told us this. Yeah, his wife is living with him as a submissive wife, but yeah, when he corrects her and he's got it right, he takes that correction, he modifies his behaviour, and he moves on. Although she lives submissively with her husband, when it comes to it, he's wrong about a matter of some spiritual significance. She's well up for a reasoned reproach of his moment of flummoxed faithlessness. And he's perfectly prepared to accept correction. There's an assurance there. That the worship offered sacrificially and in faith is accepted with God, and that they are going to be immortal until their work is done. But the the understanding of that comes back from hell. And he picks it up and he runs with it. They're better for being together, aren't they, those two? Don't you think? We've got this situation and it comes out of Genesis, uh, chapter 2, where the woman is going to be uh, Adam's help meet. No, she's not. <laughs> no, she's not. No, 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 no. She's going to be his counterbalance. She's going to be his etzer connecto. I try not to quote Hebrew at you too often, but it's important. She's there to be to help him by being an opposite to him. Do you remember those? You got one on your cell. You know those uh, regulators, the advanced retard mechanism. You got one on yours yeah. with the weights that swing out. Mm -hmm. You got one of those. They're great, aren't they? Don't make them like that anymore. Mm -hmm. Basically not. <laughs> and uh, what happens is as, as things get hotter, they, they uh, as things get faster, like it's hot, f faster, they swing out opposite one another. And they balance each other up, don't they? Now they're doing something else as well, right? But that's the way they work. And that's what you've got with Manoah and his wife. She is opposite, he swings that way, she swings this way, she says, No, you definitely come back. And back he comes. And they're better for being together. Spiritual heroes, then. There's the word you've been looking for conclusion. Spiritual heroes are quite exceptional, quite unusual people, but they tend to grow up in a particular, quite predictable environment. Depending on God's grace for what they've got there. Happy in the relationships they have with one another and balancing each other up. A praying home. A God-fearing home. A worshipping home. Now let's be clear whose agency is at work in this and whose agency is not at work in this. It is God who makes this happen. But he creates the environments in which it happens. If we're called to parenthood, then we're called to be good at godly parents. Whether or not it results in what we want it to, offspring that does turn out to be spiritual heroes, often we see good and godly parenting, and that's not the outcome. It's more difficult than that. But where good and godly parenting does result in the raising of, of spiritual heroes, those heroes grow not because they've got exceptional parents, but because they're blessed by God. And that's the key to it. That's the key to it here with Samson and his family. It's God's blessing that results in the growth of spiritual heroes. But God blesses spiritual heroes with the sort of homes that raise them, as well as with hearts stirred by His Spirit. Because that's with verses 24 and 25. Are taking us. 
Lord and gave birth to a boy. God had promised. And named him Samson. And he grew and the Lord blessed him. There you go. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. While he was in Mahanech Dan between Zorah and Eshtol. Those places. Notice where Samson was when God started to stir his heart. God's Spirit started to stir Samson at home, where he was from. Not after he'd been away to some camp or conference, much reliance on those. Not after he'd been away to Bible college and learned Hebrew and Greek, well, he wouldn't learn, but you know what I mean. His heroism was born at home, and it is at home that the Spirit of God began to stir and move and empower that character that had been imparted to him. I'm suggesting we've raised too many generations of Christian leaders of whom it cannot be said that the Spirit of God began to stir them when they were still at home. We thought, there's a bright lad, let's send him off to Bible college and let them do it to him for us. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We've not trained them in discipleship like Samson was trained at home. Heroes don't happen by accident. Exceptional people. Yeah, God organises it. God arranges it all. God does the business, right? And God empowers them. But he seems to do it within the context of a certain pattern of experience. God give us the opportunity. God give us the grace to raise exceptional people in our gracious past properly submissive to God and to one another, praying God for your worshiping homes. And may they be heroes of God, who above all else, His Spirit moves. And let's not forget that because we live in the New Testament era, God is not just bringing people from Israel anymore, but I'm praying He'll be bringing kids from out there to whom we will need to be spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers in Israel to give them what they wouldn't otherwise have. And I'm here today because of that. Because I wouldn't have been otherwise.